Hi, it's Katrina. Figures on a Roman vase. The Portland vase was first referenced in Rome at the turn of the 17th century after allegedly being discovered in a sarcophagus in the tomb of Emperor Alexander Severus. For centuries, art historians have been stumped about the imagery on the Portland vase, a small glass vessel adorned with seven enigmatic characters carved in white against a blue backdrop. Only one character on the vase has ever been identified, a male figure suspended in mid-flight, holding a bow and a torch, who experts believe is Cupid. Other depictions on the container include a heroic-looking young man and a semi-nude woman holding a slithering serpent. But nobody knows who these individuals or any of the other characters on the vase are. According to the BBC, theories include the possibility that the unknown figures represent mythological weddings or even the real-life union between Cleopatra and Mark Antony. The vase may have held the cremated remains of a high-ranking member of society, or it may have been a gift. But one thing's for sure, it was expensive, and not an everyday item, and its owner was likely incredibly wealthy and important. While scholars may never agree on the meaning of the Portland vase's images, the identity of its original owner, or its intended use, they can certainly appreciate the artifact as one of the 15 or so surviving examples of Imperial Roman cameo glass, a luxury material that was popular during the early Roman Empire and fell out of fashion by 50 or 60 AD. Exactly how the Romans manufactured the Portland vase and others like it is also unknown. Warangal Fort Located in the southern Indian state of Telangana, Warangal Fort defies the stereotypical image that comes to most people's minds when they think of a fort. Rather than being a basic, solid, cut-and-dry fortification, the surviving stone structures at this site are more intricate than imposing. Don't get me wrong, the three circular strongholds that once stood at Warangal and which were surrounded by a moat certainly served practical purposes. But the fortification system was likely weak, as invaders overthrew the site's occupants numerous times over the centuries. King Ganapathy of the Kakatiya dynasty built Warangal Fort at the very beginning of the 13th century, and his daughter, Rani Rudrama Devi, oversaw its completion, which was finished in 1261. Based on its eloquent appearance and its apparent failure to protect its inhabitants time and time again, some scholars theorize that Warangal Fort was built more as a show of extravagance than as a defensive base. During the 16th century, the early rulers of the Qutub Shahi dynasty destroyed the fort, and it remains in ruins to this day. Some structures, such as the Grand Shiva Temple that once existed at the site, have disappeared. In fact, some believe that there were as many as 365 Shiva temples at the site once, which have been lost to history, but nobody seems to know for sure. Warangal Fort attracts its fair share of visitors, however, who travel to the site to admire the structure's detailed stone carvings and ornamental arched gateways that survive hundreds of years after their creation, standing as a testament to the Kakatiya dynasty's craftsmanship and architectural skill. Shockingly accurate medieval maps In the early days of cartography or map making, maps were imprecise at best and flat out inaccurate at worst, to the point of being unrecognizable in many cases. This is why historians are perplexed over the strangely accurate dimensions depicted on a 13th century map of the Mediterranean. Inked onto vellum, the map is so precise that modern ships could effectively navigate with it. Writer Julie Raymeyer explained in a 2018 Discover Magazine article, with this map it's as if some medieval mapmaker flew to the heavens and sketched what he saw, though in reality he could never have traveled higher than a church tower. That's a very good point. Imagine if we were limited of our world view by how high the nearest tower was. The document is known as the First Portolan Chart, a type of nautical chart that was first made in the 13th century and originally depicted the Mediterranean before evolving to include other regions. Its creation marked a milestone in maritime exploration, enabling sailors to reliably plot navigational routes rather than journeying segment by segment. Whoever created this first portal and chart left his successors little to go on in terms of his map-making methods. There are no known first-hand descriptions of his work, rough drafts, or sketches, leaving today's experts puzzled as to how the cartographer's creation came to be. John Hessler, a specialist in modern cartography at the Library of Congress, has made some headway in solving this mystery by way of mathematics, which enables him to retrace the map-maker's steps, so to speak. In his lengthy study of Portland charts, Hessler reasoned that medieval cartographers used a series of measurements, equations, and directions to create a skeleton of sorts to design their map. 
Were porcelain charts flawless? No. As with any mapmakers of the time, the quandary of transferring spherical dimensions to a two-dimensional surface resulted in many imperfections. But the creations were impressive for their time, and while researchers now have an idea how they became so skilled at mapmaking, their exact formula remains elusive. Neolithic Stone Mask In late 2018, the Israel Antiquities Authority, or the IAA, announced the discovery of a Neolithic stone mask in the southern Judean desert, sparking widespread fascination as well as an intensive debate regarding the authenticity of such artifacts. The rare mask dates back roughly 9,000 years, a time during the New Stone Age when humans were first acclimating to an agricultural lifestyle. It was found following an inquiry with the IAA's Antiquities Theft Prevention Unit, and researchers later established the Panay Hever region of Israel as the probable site for its original discovery. Like other similar masks that have been unearthed, the most recently discovered one is made from soft carved limestone with eye openings, a defined mouth, and holes around its edges, which prompted experts to speculate that it was once tied to an object or a person's face. This and other masks mark an important period when humans were first starting to settle into organized communities and were therefore starting to prioritize social and religious rituals and norms. Once you get larger populations and more people living in one place, you need some social control, Alan Simmons, professor emeritus of anthropology at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, told National Geographic. That's why you start to see more formalized ritual behavior. But exactly what were the masks used for? Experts are admittedly unsure, though they speculate that the artifacts may have played a role in ancestor worship. Moreover, some researchers even call into question the mask's authenticity, believing that at least some of them are forgeries. Haunted African Artifacts In 2014, a 320-piece collection of African cultural artifacts was rediscovered in storage, belonging to the art department of Missouri Southern State University. The items, all tribal pieces originating from African countries including Sierra Leone, the Congo, Ghana, and Nigeria, included tools, woven fabrics, ceremonial masks, carved figures of various sizes, a small grave marker, iron bars that were used as currency, and more. Former associate professor of art Val Christensen had accumulated the forgotten artifacts as part of a sabbatical research project. Experts were called in to analyze and catalog the collection, and as they went about their work, they stored the artifacts in climate-controlled environments to ensure optimal preservation. Things took a bizarre turn days later when a staff member overheard shrieking, banging, and other unexplainable noises coming from the room where the artifacts were being stored. The employee rushed into the storage room and discovered a shattered mask on the floor. A few days later, the room flooded with several inches of water, and maintenance workers were unable to determine a cause for the flooding. Thankfully, the artifacts were on shelves and were relocated to a different room, which subsequently flooded. Dr. Jacqueline Lewis Harris, a University of Missouri St. Louis art historian, offered some theories as to why these strange events were occurring, including the possibility that four particular artifacts were highly charged with negative energy perhaps because they had originated from warring tribes or were crafted with the intent of exacting revenge. She speculated that these artifacts were craving water, hence the repeated flooding of the rooms they were stored in, and recommended storing them separately and performing a sage-burning ceremony to purify them. The ritual was scheduled, and there has been no word ever since regarding how effective it was. But sometimes, no news is good news. The Sea Peoples a cryptic society of maritime warriors known as the Sea Peoples laid siege to the Mediterranean for almost a century during the second millennium BC, according to ancient inscriptions and accounts, which even hint at the possibility that this civilization crumbled the Hittite Empire. Yet nobody knows exactly who the Sea Peoples were, and they know little to nothing about their culture or nationality. Ancient civilizations who warred with the Sea Peoples, namely the Egyptians, left behind the bulk of what limited information is available about this enigmatic society. Pharaoh Ramses III evidently fought numerous battles against the Sea Peoples, for example, and an inscription within his tomb details the Sea Peoples' movements as they wreaked havoc upon the eastern Mediterranean. The Sea Peoples were a federation of tribes going by the names Sherdan, Peleset, Danyen, Shekelesh, and more. While some scholars have traced these tribes' origins to Sicily, the Aegean Sea, or Turkey's Anatolia region, their beginnings are anything but concrete knowledge. 
Even more strangely, while prevailing theories indicate that the Sea Peoples were displaced from their homeland by famine or natural disasters, scholars are unsure why they were so intent on destroying societies within the Mediterranean. As fierce as the Sea Peoples were, their power came to a screeching halt after the 1175 BC Battle of the Delta, when Ramses III corralled his forces and defeated the invaders, who subsequently made an abrupt departure from the historical record. Ghost Lineage while examining the genomes of living humans in West Africa with Neanderthals and Denisovans, two Homo sapiens species or subspecies that contributed to our collective ancestry, UCLA researchers detected genetic variations that they didn't recognize. These discrepancies did not align with the genetic code of modern humans or our ancient relatives, the Denisovans and the Neanderthals. The variation is present among several groups of people, including the Yoruba of Nigeria and the Mende of Sierra Leone, in concentrations between 2 and 19 percent. Researchers believe that this unnamed ghost lineage split from hominid ancestors before humans diverged from the lineage that came to encompass the Denisovans and Neanderthals. This split occurred roughly 800,000 years ago, and the ghost lineage stemmed off on its own before this. Around 50,000 years ago, the ghost lineage reconnected with Homo sapiens or modern humans, leading researchers to conclude that at the very same time we were interbreeding with the Denisovans and Neanderthals, some people were also procreating with members of the ghost lineage. More studies are being carried out in hopes of identifying this cryptic ancestor. Secret Chamber While performing a standard excavation of the Province House in downtown Halifax, Nova Scotia in early 2019 in anticipation of remodeling, archaeologists discovered an underground stone vault roughly the size of a living room packed chock full of artifacts. Neither the archaeologists nor the construction workers on site expected to stumble upon the secret chamber, which is not mentioned in any records, maps, or blueprints of the site. They encountered the surprise vault after a backhoe hit and began chipping away at what everyone initially thought was bedrock. To their surprise, the purported bedrock crumbled easily, revealing the subterranean space. What we discovered was an open, dry stone-laid chamber with a semi-circular vaulted-type roof, principal archaeologist April McIntyre told CBC News. McIntyre submitted a report about the strange vault to the Canadian government, describing it as a subterranean stone-walled feature measuring approximately 6 meters north-south by 4 meters east-west, and approximately 3 meters high to the top of the silt that has collected on the floor. Crews were not permitted to enter the chamber for safety reasons, meaning McIntyre's summary is based on estimated dimensions. Using remote cameras, they explored further, ultimately uncovering 1,534 artifacts, primarily glass and pottery. But any concrete knowledge of the room's origins and use escapes experts for now. We're not entirely certain as to what it is, but it's similar in construction to some powder magazines that were built around that period, McIntyre said, referencing artifacts that date back to the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Whether or not researchers will further study the objects remains to be seen, as most of the artifacts were slated for storage. Sahara Stone Structures In early 2019, in the little explored region of the western Sahara Desert, archaeologists discovered hundreds of ancient stone structures of various shapes and sizes. Researchers are unsure who built them, when, or why. Some of the structures are crescent-shaped, while others are circular. Meanwhile, some form a straight line, while others are rectangular. Several of the constructions are made from rocks piled into a heap. Many use a combination of the aforementioned shapes, including a 2,066-foot-long complex consisting of straight lines, circles, rock piles, and a platform. This area remains under study due primarily to conflict between the two controlling regions, Morocco and the Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic, which lasted until 1991. Consequently, experts are just touching the surface when it comes to understanding the region's past. While they are admittedly unsure of what many, if not most, of the structures were used for and who built them, they suspect that a sizable portion of them mark graves dating back roughly 1,500 years. Additionally, evidence suggests that the arid Western Sahara was once wetter and more tropical, with more animal and plant life than it is home to today. Unfortunately, getting to the bottom of the structure's uses and origins will likely be a lengthy process due to intermittent security problems in the region that often put excavations on hold. Himera Between 2008 and 2011, workers discovered a necropolis dating back to the archaic and classical periods, containing over 12,000 ancient burials of humans and horses. 
The fascinating find was made during the expansion of an existing railway line at the site in the ancient Greek city of Himera. Situated along the border between Hellenic Sicily and an area that the Phoenicians once controlled, the burials are associated with an infamous battle that took place in 480 BC. It was the Greeks versus the Carthaginians. The Greeks won the battle, and to mark the occasion, they erected a structure called the Temple of Victory. Their glory was relatively short-lived, however, because several decades later, in 409 BC, the Carthaginians seized and razed the city. The destruction lives on in the form of the human and equestrian remains left behind at the site, buried in both mass and individual graves. Altogether, there are thought to be nine mass graves, seven from the 480 BC battle and two from the skirmish that occurred in 409 BC, as well as 30 or so horse burials. Despite being known as one of the world's greatest battles, the one that occurred in 480 BC remains somewhat of a mystery to experts. Historical records of the battle are, as John W.I. Lee put it in an article for Archaeology magazine, biased, confusing, and incomplete. That's a good way to describe it. These accounts, written mainly by 5th century BC historian Herodotus and 1st century BC historian Diodorus Siculus, leave a lot of unanswered questions, which scientists have only begun to solve relatively recently through archaeological excavations. While researchers are closer than ever to figuring out the battle's precise location and other obscure details, they have years of work ahead of them. So far, their findings have more or less confirmed what they already believed about the battle. The Bom Jesus Wreck while draining a man-made lagoon in the Namibian desert along the country's coast in 2008, geologists from the De Beers Diamond Mining Company came across a 500-year-old shipwreck, known as the Skeleton Coast, the shoreline along the Atlantic Ocean and the eastern borders of Namibia and part of Angola is famous for the appearance of shipwrecks. But this one stood out among others once experts realized that it was laden with $13 million worth of Spanish and Portuguese gold coins. Labeled by archaeologists as one of the most significant shipwrecks ever found, it sat beneath the ocean floor for centuries before it was finally discovered. Besides gold, bits of materials including metal, wood, copper, and bronze also appeared at the site. The team notified archaeologist Dr. Dieter Noli of the Southern Africa Institute of Maritime Archaeological Research of the fascinating finds, and he immediately identified one of the artifacts as 16th century artillery. Thanks to Dr. Noli's keen eye, the ship was quickly identified as the Bom Jesus, or the Good Jesus, a Portuguese vessel dating back to 1533, making it the oldest wreck discovered in the immediate area by over 200 years. The ship disappeared while traveling to India, and until its discovery, its whereabouts were a mystery. Several questions remain unanswered, including what the Bom Jesus was doing near the skeleton coast, and what caused it to sink. While Noli believes that a combination of heavy cargo and bad weather are to blame, nobody truly knows for sure. Ancient Masked Figurine Archaeologists recently discovered a strange, small, masked clay figurine set upon the shoulder of a deceased woman in a 5,000-year-old mass grave in western Siberia's Novosibirsk region. The burial is filled with the remains of people from the Odinov culture, which dates back to the Bronze Age. Their way of life revolved around hunting, fishing, and animal husbandry, and they primarily kept sheep, cattle, and horses. The Odinov people lived in dugouts in an isolated community surrounded by forest steppe terrain. The little statue, measuring roughly the same size as the palm of someone's hand, had a stripe along its face, representing a tattoo. It was laid on its stomach, and its head was ritualistically broken off and turned upwards, in a manner never before seen in the region. The statuette's head was covered with a helmet made of horse vertebrae, featuring an image of a bear. We've never come across anything like this despite our extensive knowledge of the Odinov culture's burial rites, Professor Vyacheslav Molodin, who headed the expedition, told the Siberian Times. The woman must have been an unusual person to have such a figurine escorting her to the afterlife. The deceased female was laid face down on top of a man's body, and the two were bound together in birch bark and set ablaze. Experts are thus far at a loss to explain the figurine. Sea Monster Depiction in Shipwreck Thought to be the world's best-preserved late medieval ship, the Gribbs Hunden was discovered in the Baltic Sea near Sweden roughly 500 years after it sank. Researchers were perplexed by a figurehead on the ship resembling an unknown animal that so far is best described as a sea monster. 
The 15th century image remains open to interpretation, with marine archaeology professor Johann Ronby describing it in an interview with the Express as some kind of fantasy animal, a dragon with lion ears and a crocodile-like mouth. It's unlike anything ever featured on other known wrecks, according to Marcus Sandekier of the Blekinge Museum, who said we don't have ships like this that have been recovered at all. It's something we haven't seen before. It's unique in the world, and I think there will be more excavations around here with more unique objects. The ship dates back to around the same time that Christopher Columbus sailed the seas, meaning it stands to teach researchers quite a bit about how marine vessels of the time were made. But for now, the animal that the figurehead represents remains a mystery, and experts are still thriving to understand more about the shipbuilding methods of the time. Young Viking Skeleton Archaeologists working next to Dublin Castle in Ireland recently discovered the mostly intact skeleton of a Viking child, which they believe date back to the 9th or 10th century. The remains are believed to belong to a 10 to 12 year old boy, and experts believe he may have met foul play during his final moments because of what they found. Someone apparently wrapped the boy's body in a shroud and threw him into the river Poddle, according to RTE. His shoulders were hunched together and an iron buckle was found nearby, further suggesting that the youth met a disturbing, untimely demise. Beyond that, the apparent lack of evidence of a proper burial indicates that someone harmed the boy and carelessly discarded him into the river in which he was found. All signs point toward the boy's end being violent, but archaeologists have yet to determine exactly how or why. Further tests should shed more light on the matter by definitively revealing the child's ethnicity, gender, and death date. Experts hope that this and other recent discoveries will help them better understand the lives of Vikings in Ireland. We pretty much can guess it wasn't a very peaceful and relaxing time back then, but when has it ever been? Mysterious Mummies Egypt's Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities recently announced the discovery of 13 unopened coffins thought to date back roughly 2,500 years. The caskets were found piled on top of one another, sealed in a well, nearly 40 feet deep. They were so pristinely preserved, their original coloring and designs were still visible when they were pulled out of the ground. Archaeologists discovered the baker's dozen of mummies at Saqqara, an ancient site located roughly 20 miles south of Cairo, the modern-day capital. They expect to continue making discoveries at the site, which is also home to the Steppe Pyramid, which they believe is the world's oldest such structure of its type. This discovery happened just one week after Egypt opened its borders again, along with its archaeological sites and museums to visitors. In a Twitter post, Khaled El Enani, Egypt's Minister of Tourism and Antiquities, said it was an indescribable feeling when you witness a new archaeological discovery. Very little is known about the recently unearthed burial so far, leaving us with no choice but to await further details. Number 4. Ancient Fort in March of this year, before everything was closed down, archaeologists began excavating Arthur's Seat, an extinct volcano overlooking modern-day Edinburgh, Scotland. They discovered a fort built by the Votadini, an Iron Age Celtic tribe that once lived in southeast Scotland and northeast England. The ruins date back some 3,000 years. A nearby burial site called Traprain Law once served as the Votadini's capital. Evidence suggests that they were ultimately Romanized and integrated into early Scottish culture. Archaeologists are still conducting excavations on the site atop Arthur's Seat, which still bears evidence of walls despite being heavily eroded. The 820-foot-high summit also contains evidence of buildings discovered during previous digs, including thick stone walls. Researchers believe that the Votadini used part of the mountaintop land, which is now empty and stands in stark contrast to how it looked in the past, for farming and trading. Female Skeleton Circle Several years ago in Germany's Saxony-Anhalt region near Brücken Hackfufel, someone unearthed what archaeologists would later call Germany's most important archaeological find in decades, an ancient 1,500-year-old tomb belonging to a Germanic lord. It was surrounded by six female skeletons arranged in a circle, suggesting that the women were either human sacrifices or voluntarily gave their lives in some sort of cultish ritual that called for them to accompany the Lord into the afterlife. They may have been widows or concubines. Oddly, the man's remains have yet to be unearthed, leading experts to believe that his ashes may be located in a cauldron within the central tomb, which serves as the centerpiece that the female bodies encircle. 
The location of the discovery, which was made while clearing land for a new chicken farm, is being kept a secret to avoid grave robbers from looting the site. Besides the burial of the Germanic lord, the property appears to serve as a royal cemetery of sorts, with seemingly important individuals laid to rest within it. Prophecies Missing from the Bible In a recent airing of the Discovery Channel series Dead Sea Scrolls – The Doomsday Prophecy, experts revealed the discovery of scroll fragments in the Qumran Caves in the Judean Desert, where the rest of the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. Thanks to advancing technology, they are now finally getting to the bottom of the mysteries revolving around the cryptic artifacts, which date back to the first century. Known as the War Scroll, its contents are not featured in the Bible, and the fragments, which were found scattered throughout one of the caves, known as Cave 11, appear to be a handbook for military strategy and operations that contain an otherwise unmentioned prophecy. It's one of numerous ancient texts that did not make their way into the Bible, and it predicts what researchers referred to as a violent cataclysm between two groups called the Sons of Light and the Sons of Darkness. This could have been the Siege of Masada, one of the first Jewish-Roman Wars' last events, which took place on a hilltop in modern-day Israel between 73 and 74 AD. The Sicarii were a group of Jewish rebels who adamantly opposed the Roman occupation of Judea, and experts believe that the newly discovered scroll fragments may provide insight into why they refused to leave Masada, despite being vastly outnumbered by the Romans. The battle is described in just a portion of the more than 1,000 scrolls that have been found in the Qumran Caves, leaving researchers eager to learn what else we don't yet know about prophecies and other events that the text may describe, but that may not be detailed in scripture. Violent Burial Mounds The archaeological record of steppe nomads is largely lacking for the most part. One of few exceptions can be found in southern Siberia's Republic of Tuva, which contains detailed evidence of the day-to-day -day lives and customs of humans who occupied the area as far back as the Paleolithic era. Of particular interest are the Scythians, a Bronze Iron Age and Late Antiquity group who left behind funerary structures filled with signs of exceptional ritualistic violence and possibly warfare, which occurred between the 2nd and 4th centuries. An international team of researchers led by experts from the University of Bern and the Russian Academy of Sciences explores burial mounds considered some of the earliest royal tombs of the Scythians. Tunug I, one of the earliest known Scythian royal tombs slash burial mounds, was excavated starting in 2017. The digs led archaeologists to a nearby cemetery containing the remains of 87 people, around a quarter of whom appeared to have met a particularly brutal demise. Some skeletons show evidence of hand-to-hand -hand combat, while others contain traces of unspeakable forms of slaughter, including decapitation, throat slitting, and scalping. Most of the victims were men, but women and children were also counted among the victims. Regarding the horrifying nature of the findings, lead study author Marco Mileia said this suggests that violence was not only related to raids and battles, but probably also due to specific, still mysterious, rituals involving the killing of humans and the collection of war trophies. He went on to mention a period of political instability that the region underwent during the early centuries AD. Mileia further speculated that these changes affected people's lives and deaths in certain ways, much like political strife still heavily impacts the daily goings-on in many parts of the world. Scientists continue to examine bones from the site bearing signs of trauma in an attempt to learn more about the deceased, including their movement, diet, and genetic ancestry. Whether or not they will definitively determine the specifics behind the gory rituals that seem to have occurred here remains unknown. Shimao. Before the ongoing global coronavirus pandemic hit, archaeologists working in China's Lois Plateau in the northernmost part of Shangxi province uncovered over six miles of walls that once belonged to a magnificent fortress city. National Geographic reported that inside is a 230-foot pyramid as well as painted murals, jade objects, and other beautiful artifacts. The team found 70 stone relief sculptures at the site depicting things like monsters, serpents, and half-human beasts. 
Perhaps the most disturbing discovery was that of 80 headless human skeletons contained within six pits near the city's eastern wall, indicating the possibility of a ritual decapitation that took place while the wall's foundation was laid. This could represent the earliest known evidence of a human sacrifice. The city's original name is unknown, but the ruin site is now called Shimao, and its evidence dates back 4,300 years, roughly two millennia before the oldest part of the Great Wall was constructed. Shimao was mysteriously abandoned after peaking between 2300 and 1800 BC, roughly 500 years before the earliest Chinese inhabitants arrived hundreds of miles to the south. Its existence is not mentioned in any ancient texts, as far as experts can tell, as large, complex societies from that far north remain conspicuously absent from the historical record. The city, which was bigger than Manhattan's Central Park, is considered China's largest Neolithic settlement. Shimao was extremely well fortified and was situated in the borderlands between warring Central Plains farmers and northern steppe herders, leading researchers to believe that its residents routinely faced danger. Historians are both perplexed and fascinated by the finds, which are causing them to rethink the beginnings of Chinese civilization. Ancient Egyptian Head Cones Archaeologists have long wondered about coffee cup-sized, cone-shaped hats that people are often seen wearing in ancient Egyptian artwork. Until recently, experts were unsure whether these hats ever actually existed, or if they were symbolic. Finally, in late 2019, researchers uncovered two of the headpieces in 3,300-year-old burials at Akhetaten, a unique archaeological site containing the ruins of one of ancient Egypt's most unusual cities. The three-inch tall hats, which were cream-colored and seemed to be made of beeswax, were found in the graves of low-ranking laborers, with the cones entangled in their intact hair. So they were definitely real, and not just symbolic. Researchers detailed their findings in the journal Antiquity, pointing out that the confirmed physical existence of the cone hats dispels any theories about them being symbolic of status in ancient Egyptian artwork. The artifacts also challenged the theory that the cones were made of a substance that melted in the sun and cleansed the wearer's head and body. Oddly, however, artwork implies that upper-class members of society wore the cones more commonly than low-ranking citizens, yet the hats were found in a worker cemetery. Were the laborer's cones perhaps a way of imitating elite style? That's one possibility. As archaeologists now know, finding evidence of the cone hats was merely the first step in trying to untangle the mysteries surrounding them. Who knew a hat could lead to so many questions? Swimming reindeer This strange elongated object was actually carved by humans. Around 13,000 years ago, in what is now France, someone carved a sculpture of two swimming reindeer out of the tip of a mammoth tusk. It was discovered in two pieces in 1866, and a French Catholic priest and archaeologist realized during the early 20th century that the pieces fit together to form the image of two reindeer, a larger stag followed by a smaller female, swimming nose to tail. Can you see it? Do you see it? Created during the Late Ice Age, a period that eventually became known as the Magdalenian, the sculpture shows that humans, reindeer, and mammoths existed at the same time at some point in history. When the artifact was made, the region experienced a climate much like modern-day Siberia. The 8.7-inch long sculpture's exact purpose or use is unknown. Experts speculate that it may have been a totem of some sort, which represented an individual or group, or it perhaps represented a myth or had an allegorical meaning related to the circle of life and survival. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Ancient Rock Art Figures Back in 1891, an Australian rancher named Joseph Bradshaw got lost and discovered thousands of dancing red figures painted on the wall of a rock shelter in the country's sparsely populated Kimberley region. The slender figures, called guions, looked like nothing he or anyone else at the time had ever seen before. There are actually thousands of figures with detailed headdresses, tassels, boomerangs, and spears. This style is very different from other cave art found in the area. Archaeologists were mystified, unable to determine who painted the figures, when, or why. That all changed earlier this year, when scientists came up with a very creative way to date the paintings. 
they were finally able to determine their age based on carbon dating of fossilized wasp nests found along the same rock faces. This helps date the artwork to around 12,000 years ago, give or take 500 years. This is the closest experts have come so far to unraveling the mystery of the figures, since the ochre pigment they were created with is not datable. At the time, the last ice age was rapidly ending, causing sea levels to rise. As a result, the Kimberley region that the Gleon people inhabited shrank by as much as half displacing populations and forcing people to relocate inland. Researchers believe that the figures depicted in the cave art may reflect the chaos of the changing environment. While the Guion people remain largely a mystery to experts, the ability to date their artwork partially solves the puzzle, allowing them to focus on answering other questions about the ancient society and the conditions they lived in. Sahara Stone Structures In 2018, archaeologists working in the little explored western Sahara region of Africa revealed the discovery of hundreds of strange stone structures of all shapes and sizes, thought to date back thousands of years. The findings remain unexplained, with experts unsure who built them or why. Some of the structures are circular while others are crescent-shaped, rectangular, or built in straight lines, and the builders also combined these shapes. These people really liked shapes and lines. The researchers believe that some of these formations were used for marking graves, but they don't know what their other purposes were. It's difficult to determine the structure's ages given the lack of surrounding artifacts, although some sites contain human remains dating back roughly 1,500 years. War between Morocco and the Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic, which lasted until 1991, largely prevented scientific digs from happening in the Western Sahara. Since then, archaeologists have just started excavating throughout the region, and fieldwork very rarely occurs due to security concerns. But there are, no doubt, plenty more artifacts waiting to be discovered, which will help reveal the region's untold history. Mitanni Empire Palace A drought that plagued Iraq in 2018 caused the waters of the Mosul Dam to recede, revealing the ruins of a 3,400-year-old palace belonging to the Mitanni Empire, one of the region's least understood ancient civilizations. Archaeologists rushed to retrieve the artifacts from the banks of the Tigris River while they had the chance, adding to the mere handful of evidence of the Mitanni Empire that has ever been found. As the waters rose, re-submerging the ruins, the team gathered what they could, including ten cuneiform clay tablets and bright red and blue wall paints. German researchers hope to learn more about the Mitanni Empire by interpreting the tablets. The society is so little studied, experts have not even identified its capital city, although they do know that it once ruled over parts of Syria and northern Mesopotamia. They also believe the Mitanni Empire existed between the 16th and 13th centuries BC, during which time it wielded great power over the region, but apparently they have left little behind for us to learn more about them. Church in a Fortress a 2019 study by archaeologists working in Durban, Russia, a city along the Caspian Sea, asserts the possible presence of one of the world's oldest churches in the northwestern corner of the Naren Kala Fortress. The fortification dates back to 300 AD and houses an unidentified, almost completely hidden, cross-shaped structure, which sits 36 feet underground. Unfortunately, it's unlikely that scientists will get to the bottom of the mystery, as the ruins are part of a UNESCO cultural heritage site, meaning excavation is prohibited, so far. This leaves researchers with little to no other options besides speculating on the structure's use based on what little they do know. Besides possibly serving as an early church, the mysterious structure may have been a reservoir or a Zoroastrian fire temple, according to a statement from scientists with the Mises National University of Science and Technology, who examined the site using a new technology called muon radiography. The new findings leave experts in doubt about the structure being intended as a water storage tank, although it may have been repurposed as one during the 17th and 18th centuries. But for now, and perhaps indefinitely, they have no choice but to put forth their best guess about what the building was used for. Pre-Egyptian Neolithic Peoples Before ancient Egypt rose to power as one of history's most iconic empires around 3100 BC, it was preceded by the presence of Neolithic peoples, who occupied the region between 9300 and 4000 BC. In fact, these societies influenced later, more advanced civilizations, yet the question of exactly who they are remains unanswered. This lingering mystery is due in part to scholars' heavy focus on the Neolithic inhabitants' successors, leaving the early residents understudied. But many important sites that could reveal information about these societies are difficult to access due to both their remote locations and the need for the modern government's permission to excavate. Researchers are now turning more attention to these Neolithic peoples, however, 
a 2018 study of six burial sites along an extinct seasonal lake, published in the journal African Archaeological Review, revealed that the region was wetter during the Neolithic period than it is now, although it wasn't exactly lush with vegetation. But this enabled people to live in areas that are now simply unrealistic for human habitation, because they're too dry. The archaeologists who conducted the study focused on the final Neolithic years between 4,600 and 4,000 BC, during which time they erected megaliths, shrines, and calendar circles, and began formally burying their dead in cemeteries. Researchers excavated cemeteries containing around 68 human skeletons and a vast array of artifacts, including pottery, seashells, cosmetic tools for women, stone weapons for men, and stone and ostrich shell jewelry. The people occupying one cemetery lived into their 40s, and sometimes even their 50s, vastly outliving most humans of the time. They were also taller than most other people back then, with men measuring around 5.5 feet tall on average, while women were roughly 5.3 feet tall. Yet strangely, the archaeologists found another cemetery showing a much higher childhood mortality, a lower average lifespan, and smaller people. While the two cemeteries could have belonged to different populations, the occupants bear enough similarities for researchers to believe that they were shared between the same group of people. They have yet to account for the differences between the remains from one cemetery to the next, but theorize that class differences may offer a realistic explanation. Perhaps the smaller, shorter-living people were commoners, while the robust, longer-living and taller individuals were members of the elite. For now, however, experts are a long way from confirming this speculation, and they have many other unanswered questions about the enigmatic people who lived in the region before the famous Egyptians. A Lost Chamber In August 2018, archaeologists announced the discovery of a living room-sized stone chamber beneath the province house in downtown Halifax in Nova Scotia, Canada. There is no mention of the underground vault and the historical record, making the find a complete surprise to everyone involved. It was first detected when a backhoe unintentionally hit what seemed like bedrock at first, but the material fell apart suspiciously easily, and upon further examination, the crew discovered the chamber, complete with a semicircular vaulted ceiling. They didn't enter the vault, because doing so was deemed unsafe, but they investigated using remotely operated cameras, and archaeologist April McIntyre submitted the findings to the Canadian government approximating the structure's dimensions as measuring 20 feet by 13 feet and about 10 feet high. Artifacts on the chamber's roof dating back between the late 18th and early 19th centuries provide the closest evidence of the vault's possible age. These items include German pottery dating back to the 17th century, a well, a coal chute, stone walls, storm drains, and drain pipes. McIntyre tried but failed to find any record of the structure existing, leaving her and her colleagues scratching their heads. In her report, she urged the government to investigate further using ground-penetrating radar. Mysterious Human Relative Researchers were confused, to say the least, when in 2018 they discovered stone tools in the Philippines that predated the arrival of modern humans by roughly 600,000 years. A study detailing the artifacts, published in the journal Nature, describes how someone used the tools to butcher a rhinoceros before leaving them behind, along with the animal's unused remains. The rhino's bones, which bear cut marks and other other evidence of deliberate mutilation are between 631,000 and 777,000 years old, meaning whoever crafted and used the tools was not a member of the Homo sapien species. In other words, they were not a modern human, but an unidentified ancient ancestor who occupied the Philippines long before we did. The discovery upends previously held notions that early hominins could not access Pacific islands that were separated by land from vast swaths of ocean. After all, researchers assumed there was no way these species knew how to sail. Or did they? Evidence now points to the contrary of these long-assumed beliefs, suggesting that early hominins indeed made deep-sea crossings. So, who made the tools? Nobody knows. The crafters may have been Denisovans, a ghost lineage of hominins that interbred with Homo sapiens at one point. But the most likely candidate, according to experts, is Homo erectus, which they know for sure entered Southeast Asia at least 700,000 years ago, as evidenced by fossils discovered in Java, Indonesia. The hominins that lived in the Philippines may have been Homo erectus descendants with a condition called island dwarfism, which results when a species evolves to live optimally in a predator-free environment, causing them to shrink. How they cross the ocean is a complicated question that researchers admittedly don't know the answer to, but they speculate that the population made its way to the Philippines by way of Borneo and Palawan to the west, or from China and Taiwan to the north. Cod Pieces 
Popular during the Middle Ages, the codpiece was a male accessory that both concealed and drew attention to a man's private area. It was appropriately named, as cod was the Middle English word for both bag and scrotum, according to Lynn Apino, who explained that the original codpiece was nothing more than a triangular cloth that covered the male private parts. No boxer briefs back then! Historian Grace Vickery argued that the earliest codpieces may have served as personal protective equipment of sorts, perhaps intended to shield the privates from syphilis, which was spreading rampantly throughout Europe at the time. Over time, codpieces became bigger and flashier, and as the accessory reached its height around the mid-16th century, it lost pretty much any protective use it once had and became strictly a fashion piece. Codpieces maintained some utilitarian value, however, often serving as storage spaces for coins, jewels, and other precious items. But they were essentially designed to glorify a man's nether region more than protect it, especially at the peak of the fashion piece's popularity. King Henry VIII, who Apino calls the poster boy of codpieces, wore one of the most bulbous and distinctive ones. Weighing more than two and a half pounds, the accessory was decorated with jewels, making it essentially impossible to ignore. While none of Henry VIII's codpieces remain, some of his conspicuously large accompanying armor pieces survive. Codpieces fell largely out of fashion by 1700, disappearing from both clothing and armor. Obviously, I don't know, but it doesn't seem practical when you're trying to run on the battlefield. The first breath mints. While the ancient Egyptians lacked the sugary diet we're so fond of today, they were far from immune to tooth decay, especially because their foods often contained lots of grit and sand from the stones they used to grind ingredients with. These materials eroded tooth enamel, making teeth vulnerable to infections. And as many of us unfortunately know, along with bad dental health often comes bad breath. Considering this is an issue even in modern times, I'm sure you can imagine that bad breath was certainly a reality back in ancient Egypt, especially in the absence of modern modern medicine, including dentists and oral surgeons. People with dental problems essentially had no choice but to suffer, as evidenced by the rotten and abscessed teeth scientists have detected in mummies, including the remains of young people. To combat the foul odor of rotting teeth and gums, the ancient Egyptians boiled honey with frankincense, myrrh, and cinnamon into pellets, effectively creating the world's first ever breath mints. The Urumi With a name that literally translates to curling blade, the Urumi is a sword that hails from southern India. The the weapon possibly dates back to somewhere between the 4th and 2nd centuries BC, but it quickly fell out of favor in the region. It survives today among two types of Indian martial arts called Kalari Payatu and Salambam. The Urumi is known for its flexible, whip-like steel blades. Urumis vary in size and in number of blades, with typical blades measuring 3.9 to 5.6 feet long. Some blades are much longer, however, ranging between 9.8 and 16.4 feet long, and most are about an inch wide. And while one Urumi was rumored to have 32 blades, those contained far less. The more blades a weapon had, though, the deadlier it was. But regardless of how many blades an Urumi was equipped with, it was incredibly dangerous and difficult to master. Hazardous not only to the wielder's target, but to the sword's operator themselves, it often took a warrior years to learn how to properly use an Urumi. The weapon's flexible blades are not used for stabbing. The wielder keeps the blades in constant motion for optimal effectiveness against their opponent, furiously swinging it over and around their head and shoulders to achieve the momentum necessary to do serious damage. Using this weapon full force prevents the operator's adversary from daring to go anywhere near them serving to create a barrier between warriors. Ancient Door Locks 6,000 years ago, an ancient Egyptian locksmith created what's believed to be the first ever pin tumbler lock, which involves inserting a key into a hollowed out bolt and manipulating pins within the mechanism to disengage the lock. If that sounds familiar, perhaps similar to modern day locks, that's because some of today's locks are built on the same principle, containing what's called a pin and tumbler system. Despite any similarities with modern locks, the ancient Egyptian version of pin tumbler locks were much different from any we're used to. For one, they were much larger, with some being up to two feet long. The first ever pin tumbler lock was made entirely out of wood, and it was a quite simple device. Its key was heavy and large and resembled a toothbrush, with wooden pegs that corresponded with holes and pins inside the lock. If you want to know more, check out historyofkeys.com. This is a whole field of study. Sherlock Holmes would be proud. The Romans and Greeks further advanced lock and key technology, creating smaller locks and introducing the use of metals for more secure protection. Many scholars view Greek and Roman locks as less secure than the ancient ancient Egyptian devices that preceded them, claiming that the newer inventions were easier to pick. But Greek and Roman locks had advantages, with some locks being hidden inside doors, and the use of iron and other metals made for stronger devices. Div 
Babe Flute. In 1995, archaeologists Ivan Turk and Janez Derjek discovered the world's oldest known instrument, the Div J Babe Flute, in a cave near Cirkno, Slovenia. Estimated to be around 60,000 years old, the four-holed Paleolithic instrument was created by Neanderthals, who carved it from the femur of a young bear. Despite its name, the Div J Babe Flute is not actually a flute, nor is it a whistle, although it's certainly capable of making music and was probably played in a similar way to the instruments of our more direct ancestors. It was carved for a right-handed musician and has a sharpened mouthpiece, which was crafted from bone and stone tools. To the surprise of researchers, the instrument is much more capable of playing notes than other Paleolithic flutes found throughout Europe, which early humans created from bird bones. The DJ Babe flute is the only one that is known to have been made by Neanderthals and is 20,000 years older than other known ancient instruments, which is precisely why experts hesitate to officially classify it as a flute. Researchers' views of Neanderthals were profoundly altered by the discovery, which showed that our prehistoric relatives, who went extinct around 30,000 years ago, had fully developed senses of spirituality and artistic expression. Tersorium Have you ever wondered how humans got by when it comes to personal hygiene before toilet paper existed? A tersorium, also called a xylospongium, or a sponge on a stick, is pretty much what it sounds like. Used by many people in the communal latrines of ancient Rome, this so-called hygienic utensil consisted of a wooden stick with a sea sponge attached to it. If you haven't figured it out on your own yet, people use this device to clean their behinds after going to the bathroom. And yes, everybody shared them, at least according to some researchers. Others believe that tersoriums were used for cleaning the bathrooms rather than the skin itself. The ancient Romans cleaned tersoriums by washing them in buckets filled with water and salt or vinegar. Their methods were ineffective, however, and bacteria spread rampantly throughout the latrines, leading to the widespread transmission of disease. But the tersorium isn't the only way the ancient Romans freshened their backsides. In 2013, researchers looked at some disc-shaped Roman relics that people once thought were game pieces for early games like draughts. But now, those gaming pieces have been reclassified as something more hilarious, as said by Dr. Robert. Robert Simmons, and something that people can relate to. These stones were actually an early form of toilet paper used by the ancient Romans. Known as pisoi, all signs point toward these 1 to 4 inch diameter discs being used for wiping after going to the bathroom. An ancient Greek proverb stating, three stones are enough to wipe one's A, bolsters this theory, as well as the recovery of pisoi at ancient Greek and Roman latrines and ceramic paintings of human figures using pisoi for their suspected purpose. Some people even inscribed their pisoi with the names of their enemies, according to the Daily Mail, meaning that every time they went number two, they would insult someone that they disliked. Dr. Simmons from the Fishbourne Roman Palace Museum says that he hopes the piece will make people smile when they learn what they were used for. Yakchal A yakchal was an ancient dome-shaped refrigerator with a subterranean storage space that was primarily used throughout Persia. It worked as an evaporative cooler. In other words, it cooled its interior through evaporation. Constructed with thick, insulating heat-resistant mortar called ceruj, yakchals were used year-round for storing ice and food in the arid desert heat. Persian engineers mastered the technology for accomplishing this by around 400 BC. During the winter, water was channeled into a yakchal from a nearby aqueduct and subsequently froze within the structure. Heat was guided upward via the building's conical shape and exited the building via openings at the top, while entries at the structure's base allowed cooler air to enter. Thanks to sophisticated engineering, water was diverted into a yakchal along the north side of the wall, enabling the wall's shadow to cool and freeze the water more quickly. Thousands of years ago, people could enjoy a shaved ice dessert while shopping at the market. It was basically ice cream before refrigerators. Well, actually in the beginning it was more for the wealthy, but even today there is a dessert that has been around for a very long time called falude, a cold dessert made up of thin cornstarch noodles mixed with semi-frozen syrup made from sugar and rose water served with lime juice and ground pistachios. That sounds delicious. A series of surrounding structures called badgiers, made from mud brick, often help to lower temperatures inside a yakchal by acting like an ancient system of wind towers, catching high breezes and funneling them downward. Some houses also use this method to stay cool, and you can see yakchals still standing today. Santur The santur is a percussion stringed instrument, or hammer dulcimer, of Iranian or Mesopotamian origin, with the earliest known evidence of its development dating back to 669 BC. It was originally made from tree bark 
bark and stones, and strung with goat intestines, which were beaten with wooden mallets called midrop. As the instrument spread throughout the Middle East, different areas and countries created their own variations of it. While the Persian santur has 92 strings, others typically contain between 72 and 100 strings, arranged in two sets of nine bridges, totaling three octaves, which are fastened against a flat trapezoidal frame. The santur is considered native to Iraq, Syria, India, Pakistan, Turkey, Iran, Greece, and Azerbaijan. During the Middle Ages, Arabs brought the instrument to Europe through North Africa and Spain, and they also introduced the instrument to China. Nowadays, the santur is made from arguably more modern materials than goat intestines, with the left hand strings being mainly of steel, while the right hand strings are made of brass or copper. Dental Key If you think getting a tooth pulled in modern times is excruciating, just wait until you hear about the dental key. Before we were lucky enough to have the trappings of modern medicine, such as antibiotics and anesthesia, the most important one, dental infections were typically treated by extracting the affected tooth. Easy peasy, except a lot could go wrong. Extraction instruments date back several centuries at least, with one called the dental key first being mentioned in 1742, although its use likely began around 1730. Modeled after a door key, the dental key was inserted into a patient's mouth horizontally before being used to clamp down on the infected tooth. From there, the surgeon rotated the instrument to loosen the tooth, freeing the patient from the infection, while also often inadvertently causing jaw fractures and soft tissue damage. The dental key was used into the 20th century, and its design evolved over time. It became obsolete starting toward the end of the 19th century with the introduction of forceps, although the torturous tool saw a brief revival later in the 20th century with an instrument called the Dimpel Extractor. While forceps might look scary, they are actually a much more efficient and less damaging damaging tool. Automatic Doors in Ancient Greece Believe it or not, automatic doors originated in ancient Greece, though they were far from practical. Greek mathematician Heron of Alexandria developed an automatic door system based on ropes and pulleys, activated by water that was pumped from brass vessels into a second set of vats by a large fire, thereby opening the doors. It was more or less an early hydraulic system, and it was far from efficient, making it less commonly used than today's automatic doors, which are everywhere. Opening doors automatically in ancient Greece likely involved an hours-long process that was difficult to stop once it was in motion, according to interesting engineering. The Greeks probably used sliding doors to add mystic qualities to temples, where the altar's fire would be channeled through a tube into the vats of water that powered the doors. Closing the doors more or less involved the opposite of what was required to open them. The fire would burn out, causing the air to contract, the water to siphon back into its original vats, and the doors to close. Back then, this would have been a very impressive feat and would have really impacted people's religious experience. Male Member Torture Throughout certain historical periods and in certain cultures, masturbation was looked down upon as a sinful or dirty habit. Naturally, somewhere along the line, someone decided it was necessary to invent an anti-masturbation device designed to stop those who apparently couldn't stop themselves from indulging in some self-love. During the Victorian era, many doctors considered masturbation to be a drain on a man's energy and well-being that could ultimately lead to death. It became increasingly mainstream to believe that masturbation, aka the solitary vice, could lead to mental and physical disorders, including insanity, historian Dr. John Wolfe told News.com Australia. The time period marked the advent of numerous devices that could be likened to torture chambers, including one from the 1880s, which kept a man's member armored while generously providing a hole through which to urinate. If you think that sounds uncomfortable, imagine wearing the jogum, a spiked ring that was fitted around the base of your private parts to deter erection by causing pain. But history shows that these bizarre tools were ineffective, as evidenced by the plethora of pornography that was produced throughout the Victorian era. Thanks for watching! Would you like to learn more about fascinating ancient inventions? Let me know in the comments below, and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. See you next time! Bye!